All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to a word from the Lord. Glad to have you with us. We've got uh, we're going to start off with a little teaser. Uh, hopefully, that will pique your interest. Uh, a, I'm going to read a quote from a Baptist preacher who says some pretty wild things about the Church of Christ. And you're not going to believe, really, I don't think you're going to believe what, what he said. Maybe you will, maybe you won't. Uh, he, uh, it's a, from a Baptist professor at the Southwest Baptist Theological Seminary. And he said some pretty, uh, pretty amazing things, I guess you might say. Well, it kind of depends on how you look at it, I suppose. Uh, if you think it's amazing, you might think it baffling. You might, I don't know what you'll think about it, but we're going to let you hear what he has to say about that uh, coming up. You know, friends, the, the, the early church used, its bi used the Bible as their guide. Uh, 2, 2 Timothy 3, verse 16, uh, Paul said that uh, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for approval, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect and thoroughly furnished unto every good work. And so that is, that's what we're striving to do uh, in the Church of Christ. We're trying to get back to the Bible and let that be our guide. Let the, let the inspired Word of God be our guide and give us the direction, the, the instruction that we need to, uh, to, uh, to organ, order our lives and how we worship and, and things like that. So uh, that's where we're striving to be. But uh, sometimes, sometimes people get away from that, and uh, that's why we're trying to get people back. Now, think about this, friends. In the, in the New Testament, in the early first century, the New Testament was just being written. Uh, the, the early church didn't have the New Testament as we have it. And it was being revealed. It was being written down. It was being uh, uh, collected, if you will, as, uh, as it was being written. Second Thessalonians 2, verse 15, um, Paul tells the Thessalonians, he said, Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which ye have been taught, whether by word or our epistle." And so as they were going along, they were uh, teaching in word, and they were also writing letters. And these letters were being passed around, uh, letters from the Apostle Paul or from Peter or from other inspired writers would, would be passed around, they'd be collected. If you'll notice in Colossians 4 and verse 16, Colossians 4 and verse 16, Paul said to the church at Colossia, he said, when this epistle is read among you, cause that it be read also in the church of the Laodiceans, and that ye likewise read the epistle from Laodicea. So a letter to the Laodiceans would be sent back to, to the church at Colossae, and, and the church at Colossae would send the letter that was written to them to the church of Laodiceans. Now, obviously, they didn't have uh, uh, copy machines. They didn't have Xeroxes and, and scanners and all that thing, and, uh, you know, couldn't get, just give a little jump drive and, in a digital file back then, it had to be written down. And so surely, if you had a copy of a letter from, from an apostle or inspired writer, a copy of that would be made, meticulously it would be made for your own personal uh, use or for the, for the use of the, of the church there. And so this is how the New Testament was being propagated. It was, it was being recorded, written down, preserved, collected. And this was the New Testament. These inspired writings from, from the apostles and, and the inspired writers were being collected in the first century. Well, today we have them in, in a book form. I mean, all the truth was eventually, was finally given. Everything that was needed, 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture given by inspiration of God is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. So eventually all of that was given. It was, it was everything that God determined man needed, was written down, preserved, collected, and that's why uh, in the letter to Jude, or the letter that bears the name of Jude, uh, Jude says uh, in verse 3, Jude 3, he says, When I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. And so 
uh, the faith that was once delivered, and that, and that word, by the way, that word once delivered is, is, uh, is, is the idea of uh, one time. It was conclusively delivered. So the faith had been con conclusively delivered, and that's what he says you should contend for. And so the early church, you know, by the end of the first century, no doubt about it, all the New Testament had been written, had been compiled, it had been preserved, and that is what they used. They, had, they may have had apostles at one point uh, speaking to them the inspired words, uh, but eventually uh, all of it was written down in letters that we needed, everything that we needed was written down in letters, and uh, which, by the way, I believe that's why Paul said in Second Corinthians, uh, chapter four, Second uh, Corinthians chapter four, the uh, uh, we have this, we have <clears throat> uh, this treasure in earthen vessels, you know that that were men, men were the earthen vessels. The, the gospel of God was in earthen vessels in in themselves, but it was being written down, and that's what they followed, and so. We're, we're trying to stick to the Bible and nothing else. Now, you, you won't believe what this Baptist preacher said about the Church of Christ. Uh, and that's coming up uh, here on A Word from the Lord. But before we get that, let me give you some content information. Um, uh, the phone number, if you would like to be a part of the program, 336-427-9696. That's area code 336 and the phone number is 427-9696, that's 427-WMYN, or 627-9563, 627-WLOE, 627-9563, 627-WLOE, and that's a, this is a word from the Lord. 276-340-2653 uh, is how you can reach me. Uh, word from the Lord at gmail.com is, uh, is where you can... Uh, how you can reach me? This is my that's my cell number two seven six three four zero two six five three and and I'd be glad to hear from you and and if you want to call that number we can put you on the air with that number as well. Uh, but we want to have some Bible discussion, some dialogue, and so we hope that you will uh, participate in the program or let us know that you're listening and uh, we would love hearing from you. Now, what 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 uh, did this preacher say that's so amazing? Well. Uh, remember we said the first century church the first century church followed the Bible and friends the church of Christ is is the church that you read about in the Bible I mean it is uh, we strive to be identical to the the doctrine the practice everything that happened in the first century we try to do that very thing and so that's why you know, we're saying the Church of Christ is the New Testament church. Listen to what this this uh, this preacher said. His name is um, uh, Dr. Jeff Ray, uh, and he was well-known Baptist uh, and professor at the Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary. And this is what he said. He said he gave three reasons. Uh, he gave three reasons about the Church of Christ growing. He said, "Well, I think many of their interpretations of Scripture are are hurtfully fallacious. They, both preachers and people, do stick to the Bible. Can you imagine that? A Baptist preacher saying the Church of Christ sticks to the Bible. They definitely believe something and know what they believe. That's number two. They believe something and they know what they believe. And three, they defend and boldly seek to propagate their views on every part of the, of the ground. Now, here's a man who has no problem with the Church of Christ, or had no problem with the Church of Christ, sticking to the Bible, sticking to what they believe, and knowing what they believe. Well, certainly, you know, sometimes people say, well, you know, you just... You just uh, uh, it, it's got to be your way, or you you know, every, every, you're the only one's right. No, I'm just saying the Bible's right. But friends, if you're confident the Bible's right, I mean, wouldn't you just say it? I mean, just say it, we're saying this is what the Bible says. And then he says, and they defended and boldly propagated uh, to uh, their views on every part of the ground. And so he acknowledged that this was, you know, this was not something, he wasn't really condemning it. He was actually uh, amazed by it or appreciated it. Uh, even though he said he didn't necessarily agree with the interpretations, he said they know the Bible, they stick to the Bible, 
and they tell people and boldly to tell what they believe. Now, I want to give you full disclosure on this. This was a statement that was made by Dr. Jeff D. Ray uh, in a Fort Worth newspaper, the Star-Telegram. It was made on November the 11th, 1947. 1947. Now, why would I? Why would I, I? I use that. Well, here's why. Number one, it's because in 1947, apparently, Baptists were not afraid to acknowledge that hey, there are some there are some uh, uh, validity, or there is something to be uh, commendable, something commendable about sticking to the Bible. And friends, when we tell people, can you show me in the Bible? Can you can you say what you believe in the Bible? You know, we're scoffed at or well, you Bible thumpers, whatever. And downplayed, you know, well, blah, blah, whatever they want to say. But friends, there's a reason why we insist that people give us the Bible. And it's because that's where we get our beliefs from. That's where uh, we get what we teach from and if you're, if you're convinced that it's God's word, why wouldn't you go to the Bible? And if you're convinced that you're teaching God's word or believing God's word, why wouldn't you give the Bible? And so in 1947, it was, uh, you know, it was commendable to the point that even a, a, a sectarian preacher was actually saying, you know what, these people stick to the Bible, they believe the Bible. And it was commendable that they're, that they're, that they're teaching their beliefs or spreading their beliefs, that's how firmly they believe it. So, number one, in 1947, sectarians weren't afraid to admit that this was something that's admirable. Today, uh, it's very hard to even find someone who will defend what they believe, uh, much less try to defend it by the Bible. Most of the time, they, won't, they don't want to say anything. They want to say, well, you know, that's just your interpretation, and they move on. But this man was actually commending it. That's one point. Number two, the reason why I said 1947 is because even my brethren today, many of them don't want to don't want to defend what they teach, or they're maybe shall we say they're ashamed to say this is what what uh, the scriptures are teaching, um, or they are you know they don't they're afraid that they're going to hurt somebody's feelings because they're um, not because their friend or whoever it is, is is in a church that's not in the Bible, and you know friends if if that's the point then. If that's the point where we are, that we don't want to say something that's in the Bible because it might hurt somebody's feelings who believe something that's not in the Bible, then we're in bad shape. And and the Lord's church has gotten away from that. This man was saying this in 1947 because, uh, because God's people were adamant about what they believed and they, they loved uh, the truth enough to say it. And so this is, you know, this is our, our plea. Our plea is to get back to the Bible. Men make creeds. Uh, we make pleads. Men make creeds. We make pleads. We're, we're, our plea is to get back to the Bible. If, Friends, if we just follow the Bible, we would eliminate creeds of men. We would not have uh, creeds and catechisms and uh, disciplines and bylaws and faiths and messages and whatever else it may be. We wouldn't have all these things. And you wouldn't need them. You wouldn't need them because all you have is the Bible, right? So our plea, our plea is just to get back to the Bible. Listen, I want you to consider this. This is from um, the uh, uh, the Lutheran. Let me get this here. This is from the Lutheran Confession, the ELCA dot org. The ELCA dot org. That's the Evangel Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. This is from their webpage. This is what it says under confessions, or under creeds. Under creeds, it says, like the scriptures, the three ecumenical creeds, the Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed, and the uh, Athanasian Creed, are written doctrine, are written written documents. They originate from the early centuries of Christian church history, a time when theological and philosophical questions about the identity of Jesus were widely debated among Christians. All three creeds affirm that God is fully present in Jesus, 
blah, 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 so forth. All three are affirmed in the Lutheran Confession, Confessional Writings, and the ELCA's governing documents. Here, here's my question. Why would you need three creeds that are like the Scriptures? If you have the Scriptures, why do you need something that's like the Scriptures? Why do you need to follow something that's that affirms what the Scriptures say? If you believe what the Scriptures say, then just say, I believe what the Scriptures say. Why do you need to write something down in addition to the Scriptures? Unless you're trying to be something different from the Scriptures. And, and see, friends, this is, where, this is where all the divisions come from. People want to be Lutherans. They want to be... Um, Baptists, they want to be uh, Methodists, they want to be Presbyterians, they want to be, you know, uh, uh, all, all kinds of different things. And it's because they're, they really don't, not striving for the unity that the Bible talks about. So I, I please get rid of the creeds and we'll have unity. So we make pleads and not creeds. Our plea is give up all the names of men. Give up all the names that men have originated and how, what they call themselves to be different from everybody else. Like, give up the name of Luther. Give up the name of Paul. Give up the name of Smith or whatever it may be. In, in Acts 4 and verse 12, Acts 4 and verse 12, and I think this is a scripture that nearly everybody knows, right? Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. And, of course, that name that we're talking about is Jesus Christ. That's what, that's what Peter was saying. Now, isn't that the name that everybody says salvation is in? Salvation is in the name of Christ. Salvation is by his authority. So why would you then want to follow another name? As a matter of fact, if you look again in Acts chapter 11, Acts chapter 11 and verse 26, again, the whole, uh, the whole year they assembled themselves in the church, with the church, excuse me, it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church, this is the church of Antioch, and taught much people, and the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. The disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. Why don't we just get back to that? Why don't we just get back to calling ourselves Christians? See, that's our plea. But creeds make that impossible. Creeds make it impossible to be called Christians. Creeds mean that we have to call each other different names, right? Episcopalians, Presbyterians, Lutherans, and so forth. So why? So our plea, our plea is just get back to the Bible. Uh, our plea is get back to what's authorized in the Bible. We're talking about authority, Bible authority. In Acts 2, verse 42, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship in breaking the bread and, prayer, and prayers. So why don't we just get back to the apostles' doctrine? Not a doctrine that came from an angel, <clears throat> Joseph Smith, uh, Joe, you know, not, not something that came from the angel, like like the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints believe. Angel Moroni found some golden plates and gave them to Joseph Smith. Man, you know what those golden plates would be worth today? Whew. Woo! Man, if an angel from heaven came down and gave me some gold plates, first thing I'm doing is I'm melting them bad boys down and cashing them in. <laughs> Uh, and, and and the reason I say that is because Paul said in in Galatians uh, chapter one and verse six he said I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that have called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel which is not another but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ then he said in verse eight he said but though we are an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let it be accursed. So if an angel comes down and gives you some golden plates, what you do is you say, thank you kindly, and I'm going to go melt those bad boys down and cash them in. I'm going to take them over to the Pawn Stars or whatever it is and cash them in for, you know, get some cash for them. Uh, because that, that's, that's about all they're worth. You know, that would be the that would be the most value you would get from some golden plates that an angel gave you. But if we just get back to the Bible, see, friends, if we get back to the Bible, we would have worship the way they did in the first century. That's, that's our plea. Let's get back to the Bible. Uh, and you wouldn't have any other doctrines. 
you, know, you wouldn't have doctrines of men and doctrines of, of angels. You wouldn't have doctrines that were uh, leading people astray. You wouldn't have doctrines that were unsound. Now, what do you mean by unsound? In Titus 2, verse 1, Paul said, Speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. Now, friend, sound means it's healthy. Sound means it's healthy, all right? It, it comes from a word that, that means healthy, to be sound in health. Uncorrupt. Uh, and actually, in, in the Bible, it's actually translated uh, to be in health. You know, to be safe and sound. It's what we're talking about. If someone is lost and they're found safe and sound, that means they're healthy, they're fine, everything's good. So we're talking about sound doctrine. Anything that's not coming from the Bible is unsound. Listen, First Timothy, First uh, Timothy chapter six, First Timothy chapter six and verse three. Uh, Paul said, "If any man teach and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ." Uh, and to the doctrine which is according to godliness, all right. That that's what you that, that's who you reject. Second uh, Timothy. Let's look at one more. Second Timothy. Second Timothy chapter one and verse thirteen. Second Timothy one and verse thirteen. Hold fast the form of sound words. Now, if they're not sound, if they're not sound, what kind of words are they? Well, if they're not sound, it must be that they're unsound or that they're the doctrines of devils. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 1. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. So if it's not from God, it has to be from the devil. And if we just get back to the Bible, friends, if we just stick to the Bible like was said of us in the in 1947, then you know what? We'd be a lot better off. And I'm saying that to to uh, my neighbors out here in denominations, and I'm saying that to my, my brethren in the, in the Lord's church. we got to get back to the Bible, stick to the Bible. So no doctrines uh, but that in the Bible. And here's another thing, friends. We're trying to get people to get back to the Bible and investigate. We invite people to investigate us. My friends, I wish you I wish you think about that. We encourage people and welcome people to come ask questions. Phone lines are open. Uh, give your email. You can text me. Uh, you know you know where we meet, 250 Boulevard in Eden. And so you can come and you can examine us. No, no, what other group does that? Now, I will say I did see, a, I did see an ad in the paper. Uh, and I actually went down to, to visit this place. It's supposed to be on a Saturday night. Uh, it was asking the hard questions, and so I, I went down, and uh, they weren't there. I guess that answered all the hard questions. I don't know. I think they moved their times, maybe. But but they had in the paper said Saturday night at six o'clock, and so that's that's when I went. And you know, I was going I was going to ask the hard questions. I was going to ask the hard questions about you know why are you in the Lutheran Church or why do you believe this? Why do you have women preachers? Why do you have a, a presiding bishop? You know, who, by the way, is a woman. I mean, where, where's the Bible authority for that? And so, you know, we're inviting we're inviting investigation. We invite people to come and examine us. Like, like the Bereans in Acts 7 and 11, they received the word with our readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily where those things were so. And so that's what we're, uh, that's what we're trying to do. You know, speaking where the Bible speaks and uh, doing Bible things and Bible ways and calling Bible things by Bible names and so forth. Now, uh, and so, friends, that's that's really why why we're doing what we're doing. That's why we're we're trying to be uh, the way we are. Now, friends, I want you to consider I want you to consider another statement from another Baptist. Now, this is this statement was made about thirty years later than the uh, the first one that we read. This is a different Baptist, but he's from the. Uh, um, same Southern Baptist uh, or Southern Baptist Convention. The the first one was from Southwestern Baptist the Theological Seminary. This is uh, the president, former president of the Southern Baptist Convention, uh, Dr. Wayne Dahoney. This is what he said about the Church of Christ. He said the Church of Christ <clears throat> are uh, 
they have a, sol a profile of faith and practice contradicts practically every solid conclusion by the authorities of mainline denominational establishment. So in other words, the, the authorities come up with, well, this is what we need to do to grow, this is what we need to do to be right, to be, to be successful, whatever. And he says, you know what, the Church of Christ are flourishing and they're throwing these things out the window. They're, they're rejecting these things, and the reason why they're rejecting them is because the Church of Christ typically, and I'm saying they should get back to this, is get right back to the Bible. But sadly, that's not really the case. Sadly, there, there's, a, there's so many of the, the churches in our brotherhood that are uh, trying to become more like denominations. But this is what he says. He says the Churches of Christ are anti-ecumenical in their relationships. Anti-ecumenical, anti that's, that's a $64 word. And what it means is they don't they don't do this unity and diversity stuff. They don't say well, we're all one big happy family if we're just we're just different, you know. You know, we got our Baptist brethren and our, uh, you know, our, our Pentecostal cousins and whatever. No, the the Church of Christ don't do that because they look at the Bible. They're anti ecumenical. The unity movements that you that you see from time to time in in this area and other places. The Church of Christ will do that. They're they're anti ecumenical. So don't come up and say, Well, we're you know, we're all one big happy family. No, I, I wish we were. I wish you were my brother, but we're but we're not brethren. They're conservative in their theology, autonomous and democratic in their congregational practice, uh, without any semblance of denominational superstructure. In other words, you won't find um in the Church of Christ, you won't find one man over several congregations. That's not the way the Bible has had the church set up. Um, now, the denominations do that. The denominations do that. And I'm, I'm kind of getting ahead of myself here, but I just go ahead and take this point to make. I go ahead and uh, take the time to make this point. Uh, I want you to consider this. Here's the the uh, going back to the evangelical. Lutheran Church in America, the ELCA, the North Carolina Synod, the North, the North Carolina Synod. Uh, this is what this is how the Lutheran Church is set up. Uh, the Lutheran Church has a presiding bishop, a presiding bishop, and in this case, her name is Elizabeth Eaton. There's all kinds of things wrong with that picture, brethren and friends. Um, a presiding bishop is wrong. And even if there were such things as a presiding bishop, the Bible tells what a bishop uh, should be like. It gives the qualifications for a bishop, one of which is the husband of one wife. It, it, it could not be, would not be, ever be a woman. But in, but in here you have the ELCA has a presiding bishop, Elizabeth Eaton. Now, do uh, you see the problem there? So, I mean, you will never find that in the Church of Christ. In the Church of Christ, you'll never find a, uh, a man or even a group of men over several congregations dictating what goes on here and there. They're autonomous. Uh, now, this man goes on to say this, back to what Mr. Wayne Dahoney said, he said they make rigid moral and ethical demands on their members in such matters as social drinking. Friends, the Church of Christ wants people to be pure. The Bible says be pure. Be holy as I am holy. 1 Peter 1, 15 and 16. And so uh, God's people should be holy. Uh, we don't look like the world. We don't talk like the world. We don't act like the world. We don't dance. We don't go to dances and the proms. And anybody in the Church of Christ that does that, promotes that, they need to repent. And I've, you know, I've known of, of individuals, uh, congregations of God's people that would that would promote a prom, you know, letting their letting their young people run around with uh, scanty clad dresses, you know, low, low cut, high cut, and whatever else, and they're sending them off to a a night of promiscuity at the prom, and uh, uh, asking for asking for problems. But God's people who are concerned about rigid moral and ethical demands on their members wouldn't allow that. They'd say no to that. They like social drinking. Uh, which, by the way, speaking of social drinking, uh, 
the um, uh, the, the folks on the, the council in Eden ought to be ashamed. Uh, it's, it's bad enough. It's bad enough that we have mixed drinks being even sold. But now, in case in case you want to drink a little earlier, you know, you can go get a drink at ten o'clock in the morning on Sundays now. Well, let's think about that, friends. If if we're so uh, pious and religious. Uh, where where should you be at 10 o'clock on Sunday morning? Most people would be in church if they claim to be believing God. So uh, obviously, you know, the, the, the folks who made this, uh, uh, who, who voted to, to pass this law, you know, they're not concerned about people uh, being in church, right? Being in worship, which, you know, I guess most people who, they may be, they may make. They may go get drinks after they get out of church. I guess I don't know. So uh, maybe they're not concerned about about such things. But it just shows you that the even the leaders of our of our communities aren't insistent on mo high moral standards. You know, go go out and social drink. I think there's one. I think there's one man that voted against that, and I can't remember his name. Um, I want to say Epps. I don't know if that's right or not. Maybe somebody can tell me that. I think I think he voted against that, and uh, I appreciate I appreciate that stand. I don't know his reasoning, uh, and I had his name written down, but I don't have it in front of me now, so I'm not sure about that. But but anyway, but the, the Church of Christ would say, you know, that's that was a good policy to to stand against that. Uh, the 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 Church of Christ they have a messy. They're not social action oriented. Not social action oriented, uh, friends. Let me just uh, let me run this by you. Uh, let me see uh, if I can find it here. I was looking through some headlines, and I saw something about a religious. Uh, what were they doing? They were they were marching or something. Uh, political, oh, I know what it was, so President Trump signed a bill, and I don't see it in front of me here, uh, relaxing the standards on, uh, let's see, relaxing the standards on Christian political action, I guess. Uh, if, a, if a church wants to be politically active, uh, relaxing those standards so that, you know, you don't, you don't have to uh, worry about pulling your, getting your tax exemption status uh, evoked or something like that. Well, friends, that, that sounds good on the face, but uh, in reality, I don't really care if the government uh, gives me sanction to say or do something. Um, it's, you know, I'm, I'm not social action oriented in that sense. I'm not a social justice warrior. You never see Jesus and the apostles marching in the streets and demanding, you know, equality for, uh, I don't know, you know, whatever, uh, whatever action, whatever, whatever uh, subject matters, <laughs> you know, whatever political action matters, you know, that they weren't out there marching in the streets. They were just teaching people the gospel, converting, converting them, changing their hearts, and that's what changes people. And so this man says one reason why, one thing that he appreciated about the Church of Christ was they're not social action oriented. We're not out here picketing in the streets and marching for, for equality. Equality is going to come in the Bible. Uh, that's why Paul said in Galatians, uh, excuse me, Galatians chapter 3 and verse um, 28, there's neither Jew nor Greek, there's neither bond nor free, there's neither male nor female. For you're all one in Christ Jesus, <clears throat> and so um, that's you know that's where uh, that's that's where we're going to have equality. He said they have a messianic complex of being the true people of God and the true church. Friends, is there anything wrong with with saying that you're the they're the only church that God loves? <laughs> you're the only church that God sanctions. Uh, you're the, you're the true people of God. Is there a problem with that? I, I don't know why. I think I made this point before. Uh, 
no one has that problem when they say it about the Jews. No one has a problem saying, well, the Jews are God-chosen people. No, they're not. No, they're not. But everybody thinks that if you, if you disagree with that, you're a bad person. But you turn around and say, no, the Jews are not God's chosen people today. The, the people that God has chosen today are spiritual Jews. They're not, they're not Jews according to the flesh. They're Jews according to the Spirit. Romans 2, verse 28. <clears throat> he is not a Jew which is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew which is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart. In the spirit, and not of the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of God. So, uh, I don't have a problem saying I'm a spiritual Jew. I'm a, I'm a Jew in the sense of what Paul's talking about in Romans 2, verse 29. So, who are God's special people today? The Jewish people who are spiritual Jews. Not those people Jewish in the flesh. There's not a special nation that God looks down upon today. Not not any way, shape, or form. I don't care what John Hagee says. They're not God's special people. I, I don't care what uh, uh, any other, what uh, Pat Robertson or, or uh, what's a Robinson's name? Uh, I can't remember on, uh, on, uh, on TV that's always advocating these kind of things. He and his wife are always on TV. <clears throat> but, uh, Israel of old, Israel according to the flesh, are not God's chosen people. And 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 Wayne Dahoney is saying this. He's he's actually uh, showing some appreciation for the Church of Christ because they have this this complex that, of being the true people of God. Friends, why, why can't we be that? If you're looking for the New Testament Church, you know you ought to be looking for that kind of of place. You ought to be looking for the group of people that believe that sort of thing. And so that's that's really where you're going to find the Lord's church. And so we're we're trying to be that we're trying to be what the Bible says we should be, and really what these men have recognized the church should be. Even even the denominations have recognized in the past this is what the church should be like. <clears throat> All right, let me give you our phone numbers again, in case you want to be a part of the program. Their phone number is three three six. That's area code 336. The number is 426 9696 427 or 627-9563. 627-9563-627-WLOE. <clears throat> All right. Now, uh, let me ask you this. You're, you're trying to find the church that you read about in the Bible. Uh, there are some ways you can find it. Um, you can find out if they have a headquarters. Uh, these these uh, cities all have something in common. Springfield, Missouri, Kansas City, Missouri. Uh, Springfield, Maryland. Cleveland, Tennessee. Salt Lake City, Memphis, Tennessee. Uh, they all have one thing in common. That is, they have the headquarters for denominations in those cities. Uh, the Assemblies of God is in Springfield, Missouri. Seventh-day Adventist, Silver Spring, Maryland. The Church of God denominations headquarters in Cleveland, Tennessee. That's why, by the way, when you hear someone say, "Well, I found a church I'm in in the Bible. It's the Church of God." Okay, well let's let's ask a little, ask some questions here. Uh, is your headquarters is the headquarters of the church you're in in Cleveland, Tennessee? Yes. If it is, then you're not the church you read about in the Bible. That that's just like. Friends, if you're looking for the if you're looking for the Lord's church, and you find someone says, "Well, the church of God is is the, is mentioned in the Bible." Okay, very good. <clears throat> yes, it is. But is it the same church? Does it is it everything else about it the same church? You can look up in the phone book, and you'll probably find James Oldfield. You know, if you just get on the on the uh, the interweb. If you get on the World Wide Web, you get on, type in James Oldfield, look up, look up James Oldfield, and you, you'll probably find, I don't know how many you'll find. <laughs> Haven't looked at it. But I'm sure there's more than one <clears throat> name, one, more than one person's name that says James Oldfield. As a matter of fact, I know there is. My sister said she was, 
looking for some of my stuff online and she typed in James Oldfield and I think there's a there's some guy over in Ireland or maybe he's a baritone singer named James Oldfield has a velvety voice I think is the way she said was described so I, you know I don't think that's me <clears throat> velvety voice but my, my point is you can find more than one person that has the same name. But does that mean that it's the same person? No. You, you have to go a little deeper and look at some other characteristics. Where do they live? You know, how old are they? Um, other factors like that that will tell you if you found the right person or not. And so if I'm trying to find the 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 church of Christ or the church you read about in the Bible, I may find the church that says Church of God. But if I do a little digging, I find out that, that the church of God that I'm looking at actually has a headquarters in Cleveland, Tennessee. I know that it's not the one you read about in the Bible. Isn't that easy? Or what about the church of God in Christ? Listen, that's uh, that, that's in the Bible. Uh, church of God in Christ. Um that's uh let's see that's in the, that's in the Bible I think that's First Thessalonians uh, two fourteen well yeah you have the you have uh, Paul saying for ye brethren became followers of the churches of God which in Judea are in Christ Jesus so you got the church of God in Christ Jesus now can you find a church of God in Christ oh yeah you can find the church of God in Christ in the Bible and you can find one in the yellow pages too. And if, you, if you're looking and one of them says the headquarters in Memphis, Tennessee, that's not the one you read about in the Bible. See, the Lord's church is described in different ways. But when you start digging a little deeper and you find one's got a headquarters somewhere on earth, you know it's the wrong one. And so if you're looking for the church of the Bible, the church of the Bible follows a doctrine. And so... It, it's going to have a right name. It's going. It's not going to have a headquarters, but it's going to follow the the doctrine, which is the Bible. That's that's where we started. We're getting back to the Bible, because for the Church of Christ, the Bible is the final authority. I remember on one occasion I asked I was a preacher one time. I said, "Where do you get the authority for instrumental music?" And he said, "He said you're talking over my head. What do you mean authority?" Well, if if you don't understand authority the permission to do something, then, ooh, we got a long way to go. You know, you, you can't just do what you want to do. I mean, if the police officer stopped you and said, who gave you the authority to uh, to park in a no parking zone? Who gave you the authority to drive 50 miles an hour through a school zone? Who gave you the authority, uh, right, to uh, uh, park in the handicapped spot? If they asked you that, you'd say, well, you would know, know exactly what he's talking about. You don't have permission to do it. And so what we're talking about in the Bible, we're talking about the authority to do something. Well, the church, the church of the Bible <clears throat> looks at the Bible to find out how it, what it should do, how it should be ordered, or how it should be organized. <clears throat> 1 Corinthians 9, verse 14, Even so hath the Lord ordained that they which preach the gospel should live of the gospel. 1 Corinthians 9, 14. So the Lord ordained it. Now that means the Lord has given the authority for it. In 1 Corinthians 14, 37, If any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. The things that Paul's writing are the commandments of the Lord. Now, friends, that's where we're getting our authority from. We're getting our marching orders from the commandments of the Lord. So here's a question. Can you find authority in the Bible for what you do in the church that you're in? Number one, can you find the church that you're in in the Bible? If you say, well, I can find his name, okay. <clears throat> can you find authority for, for what you do? Can you find authority for the way the church you're in is organized? See that? Can you, can you find that authority? And Paul said, no, whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. 
Colossians 3.17. That is, whatever you do and whatever you do, do all by his authority. So can, can you find it? <clears throat> so that's all we're asking. Uh, I mean, what, what does the church organization look like? Uh, when, when, the, when the apostles uh, organized the church, when they were giving um, scripture about how the church should be organized, let me say it that way, what did they say? Well, when Paul's writing to the Philippians, the church of Philippi, he writes, Philippians 1 verse 1, he says, Paul and Timotheus, the servants of Jesus Christ, there's the evangelist, to all the saints in Christ Jesus, which are at Philippi, there's there's members, with the elders, our bishops, there's with the bishops, that's the elders, and deacons, those are the servants, special servants, whose qualifications, by the way, are listed in First Timothy chapter three. That's elders and deacons in First Timothy chapter three. Now notice there, there's no pope. There's no presiding bishop, right? There's no convention, no no synod, no council that legislates the church or dictates the church or tells folks what to do. It's just, it's just not there. So why why would you, number one, be in a church like the Catholic Church where there's a pope uh, or, say, the Lutheran Church where you have a presiding uh, bishop that doesn't follow the qualifications for a bishop, by the way, uh, why would you be in that church? Why would you say, well, everything's fine? You, you, would, you would do that. Now, friends, let's be honest. You would do that if, number one, you didn't know any better. Or if, number two, you just didn't care. Now, if you're in a church that has a pope or a presiding bishop or, you know, one man's over several congregations and he's he's the bishop or he's the cardinal or however however the hierarchy works, that's, that's not mentioned in the Bible. Uh, a woman pastor or elder bishop, if that's how your church is organized, then, friends, that's not the, that's not the church in the Bible. See? And I'm saying we're, we're trying to stick to the Bible, which used to be admirable. That's where we started. That's, that's the point I started with. It used to be admirable. It used to be something that everybody said, you know what, they, they stick right to the Bible. Man, they 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 just they do it right by the book. They go right by the book. And nowadays, it's like we people don't even care about the book, right? So so the church you're in, uh, is it organized the right way? Is it organized the right way? Now, I want you to notice something that the the elders have certain qualifications. Like I said, I'm not trying to. Uh, keep harping on this point here, but go back to what we talked about on the the, the Lutheran uh, Synod. Here's the presiding bishop is, is Elizabeth Eaton. All right? Well, here's what Paul said in 1 Timothy 3, 1 through 7. He said, this is a true saying, if a man, if a man desire the office of a bishop, he desires the good work. So right off the bat, the bishop is supposed to be a man. A bishop must then be blameless, the husband of one wife. There's two strikes right there against the Lutheran Church's presiding bishop. All right, uh, must be the husband of one wife, uh, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, and so forth. Um, so, it, I mean, it, it doesn't take long before you you start seeing that you know what these people are organized right. They're, they're just not organized right. And why would you want just one man to be over one church, one congregation? Why would you want just one man doing that? Much less, much less one person over several congregations. I mean, why, why, would, you, uh, why would you want that? All right? Listen again, Titus 1, verses 6 through, through 11. If any be blameless, the husband of one wife. It must be the husband of one wife. You just can't get over that. I mean, you have to stop right there. Uh, and so, um, I'm saying, friends, when you're looking at your at the church you're in, is it organized like the church that you read about in the Bible? 
and no one would no one should want one man to be over all this listen elders in in God's in God's church in his plan elders do have some rule they have some they have some authority um Titus 1 verse 5, For this cause left I thee in Crete, that thou should have set in order the things that are wanting, and ordain elders in every city as I have appointed thee. Um, now, some of them might say, well, James, there's your, there's your authority for bishops over several churches, you know, a diocese or a synod or whatever. Ordain elders in every city. But, but look, it's written again in Acts 14 verse 23. It's written, and when they had ordained them elders in every church and prayed with fasting, they committed them on the Lord, on whom they believed. So you, you have elders that are over an individual congregation. Elders, plural, always plural, always more than one. And they're never over just one church. They're never over just one church. Um... I mean, I'm sorry, they're always over just one congregation, then they're over several, but never one person in authority. And, friends, there's wisdom in that. There's wisdom in that that man seemed to overlook. And so we're saying let's get back to the Bible. If the church, if a church is going to operate on the authority of Christ and his apostles, it has to look a certain way. So friends, don't call up and tell me you're you're in a church you read about in the Bible, and then we start finding out that you're that the church you're in is organized differently. Uh, why would why wouldn't God have it this way? Why would God have you see, actually? Why would God have it this way? Uh, well, notice this in First uh, Thessalonians five twelve. First Thessalonians five and verse twelve. Paul said, we beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you. That labor among you, that labor among you, they, they are among them. 1 Peter chapter 5, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 1, elders which are among you, I exhort, who am also an elder and a witness of the suffering of Christ and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof not by constraint, but, but willingly, not, a filth, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind. Uh, not being lords over God's heritage, but being examples unto the flock. Now, think about this. If you've got one man, <clears throat> one man, or in the cases we've just been looking at, one woman, who has assumed the role of a bishop for which he's not qualified in the, in the remote. But if they're taking charge over more than one congregation, how are they among them? How are you among how are you among people in different cities? How are you, how are you among people in different parts of the state or different parts of the country? You, you can't be among them all the time you can't I mean some say well you know a farmer's got got cow got a, a rancher's got cows and they got them in different pastures he's the rancher to them all well okay you may have to go to pasture to pasture to look at them but you know what this is not how God has set up the church God doesn't set up three uh, three flocks and have one shepherd that walks around all of them he said if you got a man that's qualified to be a shepherd he's going to be a shepherd in that congregation but not by himself even. Uh, listen, God knows that pride comes into play. And that's why you don't want one man uh, to be in that place. Lest he become uh, not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into condemnation of the devil. So... God doesn't want one man to be in charge of his flock lest, you know, lest he start lording over the flock and say, I'm going to do it my way. All right? I'm going to do it the way I want to. Now, friends, this is just the wisdom of, of God's uh, doing things according to the Bible. And, friends, that's what we're trying to get you back to, to doing. We're trying to get you to say, you know what, let's, let's look and see what the Bible says. 
And there's a reason why God organized the church in this way. Qualified men over each individual congregation because each church is autonomous. That is self-governing. Uh, each church, if they were qualified, had their own elders. If the men were qualified, they had their own elders. Acts 20, verse 17, Paul called the elders of the church at Ephesus to meet him in Miletus. Now, why, why didn't he call the, the elders and say, now, you're also over the church in Miletus. Yeah, I'm, I'm calling you here because, after all, this is part of your diocese. He, he didn't say that. He called them Miletus because he couldn't get to them. He said, meet me over here. So they did. But they were still the, the elders of the church at Ephesus. They were not elders in any other congregation. And so there's a reason why God organized the church this way, to have men over one particular congregation looking after the affairs of one particular congregation <clears throat> and not over several. It's a, it's a checks and balances, if you will. Uh... A fellow used example, this example. It's like the difference between a plate glass window and a window that has several different window panes. If you throw a rock into a plate glass window, you replace the whole window. Because it's all going to break. But if a rock hits a window pane, you can just replace that one little window pane, you know. Eight, eight inch square window uh, that's a whole lot easier place than a, you know a five or six foot square window you know just replace that one little pane maybe not even before you know eight yeah probably about eight inches or less maybe it's easier to replace that one you see it, it preserves it it keeps everything intact so God knew that you know if I if uh, if I organized the, the churches in such a way that one man is going to be over several boy I mean, there, there's no stopgap there. And so this is why God would not want just one man, you know, in place. Lest they be lived up with pride. Start seeking the power, enjoying the power. I mean, Paul didn't even want that. You know, Paul didn't want to be in charge of, of everything. And so, you know, he made sure there was checks and balances in place. Now, uh... If, if we're looking for the church that God established, you know, let's, let's go to the Bible, see what it looks like. And friends, I know you can find it. I know you can find it because we're, we're trying to show it to you. I mean, it's right in front of you if you would just, if you'd come visit with us, you, you could see it. You could see it. Okay, uh, I'm going to get the phone numbers one more time. I know we're running out of time, but I want you to, have got about three minutes, so if you want to call in the last minute, <clears throat> then you're welcome to do that. Uh, there you go, 336 427 or 627-9563, 627-9563, or you can call me, 276-340-2653. Friends, uh, if you're looking for the church that you read about in the New Testament, uh, you're, you're hearing about it right here. Um, the Church of Christ meets at Two Feet of the Boulevard in Eden, and you're welcome to visit with us, 9... A.M. for Bible study, 10 a.m. for worship, and uh, six uh, uh, Thursdays at 7 p.m. for Bible study as well. And we're studying, actually this is some of the material we're studying. We're studying the church you read about the New Testament, the church that if you're reading the New Testament, this is the church you're going to come across, the church you're going to find. And how do you know that it's the church you read about in the Bible? So let, let's help you find it. Friends, again, our plea our plea is to get rid of the creeds. That's our pleads. One of our pleads is to get rid of the creeds. One of our pleads is to get back to the Bible. Drop the names of men. Drop the darks of men. Just get back to worshiping the way God said do it. And friends, you know, it's, it's an admirable thing to get back to the Bible. Again, the, the quote we started off with was a Baptist preacher saying, the church of Christ sticks to the Bible. Don't you want to be a part of that? Don't you want to be a part of the group that, that sticks to the Bible? Let's get back to the Bible. If we get back to the Bible, we'd cut out a whole lot of foolishness, a whole lot of foolishness in the world. Not just in the religious world, but in, in our culture and our society altogether. All right, friends, I'm out of time. 276-340-2653 is how you can reach me at wordandlord.gmail.com. 
Until next time, always make sure that what you're getting is a word from the Lord. Have a good night.